Hello and welcome to HCA 214 Integrated Healthcare Delivery Systems. My name is Chris Gibbons and I am so pleased to be your instructor for the next eight weeks as we explore this topic. Now, the lectures that you'll have here are really meant to augment the textbook, so please make sure you do have a thorough reading of the textbook. I would like to look at these lectures really to help with maybe terms and um, concepts that are presented in the textbook and hopefully add some clarity uh, with with those topics that are presented. I like to start each lecture off with talking a little bit about terminology and then also touching on after that touching on some of the um, concepts and the history uh, of those concepts that are presented within that particular week's reading. So kind of use it to augment the reading. Do not use it to substitute for the chapter reading. Now there have been so many changes going on in healthcare, especially with the Affordable Care Act has totally transformed the landscape of healthcare over the past couple of years and will continue to transform uh, the way that we do things in the years to come. So with that, we will have a focus on the Affordable Care Act and look at um, a lot of your discussions for each of the modules that we'll have will center around the Affordable Care Act. Also, um, keep in mind that as far as any tests or quizzes that you may have, uh, there could be information within the lectures that may not be presented within the textbook. So again, use both, do both, uh, don't rely on either one to get you throughout the entire course. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this week. This week we're going to be looking at a very broad uh, look at healthcare and uh, healthcare business, and that's very important. Uh, to know that healthcare is actually a business. So we're going to be going over some of the basics uh, for the landscape of healthcare in general in the U.S., especially with this module and chapter one. All right, so let's get started uh, talking about that. So go ahead and sit back, relax, and, and learn on what we have to present for today. Every week is going to start with a word cloud. This week's word cloud, like every word cloud to come, highlights the terms that are integral to the chapter's content. Some of the terms you may be familiar with and some not so much. Spend some time with the glossary of the text in furthering your understanding of them. Highlight them when you come across them in the textbook. This will help you understand the context on how those terms are used, which will further help you understand and be able to use the terms themselves. Adopt them in your new professional language for discussion boards and assignments, and add them to your work life. Today's healthcare is a hot topic. So many changes have happened to healthcare and its delivery in the past 20 or 10 years, even the last year. Now, technology is making great strides, and the adoption of it as a tool in the delivery of healthcare has been fraught with some ups and downs. Some of these new technologies were developed to help the health system and its functionality towards seamless delivery, like electronic health records, or you might hear the term EHR. And of course, there is the Affordable Care Act, as I mentioned earlier. There is much that has been fought for and argued over and succeeded and failed with the Affordable Care Act, but it's still in its infancy. We will, I'm sure, witness more mistakes and corrections and hopefully successes as time goes on. Some of the biggest obstacles in delivering quality health care have been costs, access, and quality. The government has tried throughout its history to develop programs and incentives, research issues and trends in health care, and also develop legislation, legislation to break down some of these obstacles. Not every reform was met with success. This made a pathway for private insurers to take over through the development of managed care organizations, or you might hear the term MCOs. Although the proposed government programs tried to maintain some balance among costs, quality, access, the primary goal of the MCO is to contain costs and to realize profits. Like I said earlier on our introductory slide, that healthcare is a business and it is a big business. Okay, so the cartoon in the upper left hand corner of this slide might be a little unfair now, but at one time doctors held sway over medicine. Their word was the final word on everything. 
If you did not agree with the news they delivered, you could always walk away, but the problem would not be fixed. Or you could get a second opinion, but patients didn't argue with doctors back then, no matter how they felt about it as a patient or what the doctor had to say. Not that what the doctor had to say was necessarily wrong or bad, it's just that docs took the medical degree they earned so seriously that they knew more than most anyone on any medical question. Your book is very eloquent when it says early practitioners fostered a mystique surrounding medical care as a means to set themselves apart from patients they served. Endowing health care with a certain amount of mystery encouraged patients to maintain blind faith in the capabilities of their physicians, even when the state of science did not justify it. Today, we are hopefully not as harsh with physicians as they, as a group, have let their guard down somewhat, improving their bedside manner. And today's healthcare system, the physician is not the only one directing the healthcare decisions. What used to be sacred confidentiality between a doctor and the patient has really become kind of like a group project. The physician now has to relinquish their healthcare sovereignty to insurers who have gained much control in deciding what the patients need. Patients too have gained control over their decision, although not as sweeping as with the insurer. Insurers always have the coverage denied or with a physician that I can't or won't do that. So ultimately they still have a, the balance of power. Patients are left with a choice of decisions made by others who sometimes don't communicate with each other. This lack of transparency has been the crux of how patients perceive providers. Add to this widely available access to information as well as misinformation via the internet. Again, patients want the ability to turn to a physician whom they can trust for answers and partner with in their health care. We have evolved health care into a shared decision making process, or at least that is our goal. Although we have created to a degree a system of health care checks and balances, we have very far to go in the delivery of affordable and high quality health care, and particularly in the areas of life expectancy and infant mortality in the United States. Let's take a look at disease history and the levels of prevention. Your text has several charts on this and a lot of discussion. Let me break it down a little bit for you. Epidemiologists are very smart folks. Along with service planners, they've devised a matrix containing everything known about a particular disease or condition in a particular order from its origin and then progression when left untreated. This plotting or matrix is called a schema and this schema is known as the natural history of disease. Natural because it allows the disease to take its own course without the benefit of medical intervention. This information is extremely valuable when treating disease since disease can be long lasting or chronic as well as immediate or acute. Being able to plot a disease progression leads to the right form of treatment at the right time. Because these interventions are designed to stop the disease from progressing to the next step, the interventions are called levels of prevention. That takes us to the picture that you see on this PowerPoint slide. There are three levels of preventions, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Number one, primary prevention is also known as the prevention of disease occurrence and refers to measures designed to promote health like exercise and specific protections like immunizations. Now the second level, the secondary prevention involves early detection, prompt treatment for either an early cure or to slow or halt the progression of a disease. And number three, the very top one, is the tertiary. And the tertiary prevention consists of rehabilitation and maximizing remaining functional capacity when the disease has already occurred and left the victim or the patient with some residual damage. This level is the most costly and labor intensive. It depends on the teamwork from numerous resources. 
think of how expensive it is to run an ICU. The three-level model demonstrates two important aspects of the U.S. healthcare system. The first one is the focus of healthcare has been directed at the curative and rehabilitative side of disease of the disease continuum. And then also the value of planning and community services is embedded in this three-level model as well. The stakeholders in the United States healthcare system or industry encompass everyone in the United States. First, the public. They are the first and foremost because they are the ones that consume the services. Many of the public are unaware of their position of great power in this business. Insured or undersured, you are a stakeholder in this. Why? Because you're human and your parts will wear out or break. You will get sick and you will need med medical attention of some kind somewhere down the road it's unavoidable and whether you have insurance or not you will be treated let's take a look at the employers they pay a high proportion of the cost of their employees health care insurance premiums so they have a lot of sway money talks let's look at the providers on here the providers from the doctor to the nurses to the radiologic technologist to the medical coder these people touch every aspect of healthcare delivery. We have healthcare facilities. These are central to the healthcare system because they house the healthcare services and the providers. Governments. Well, we have governments as multi stakeholders, as players, as regulators, as provider of healthcare services. Also, alter alternative therapies have a position in this org chart. These therapies contribute significantly to the, the amount, the frequency, and the cost of health care. They are popular choices, accounting for one in three adults opting for alternative treatments. Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurers provide benefits for some complementary therapies. Nine billion a year is spent on each one of them. Next, we have the health insurers. They're a major stakeholder who help shape the Affordable Care Act. Managed care organizations, or as we talked about earlier, MCOs, are the predominant form of health insurance. They can be owned by insurance companies or hospitals, physicians or consumer cooperatives. Next is long-term care. Being part of the uh, near 50 set, or getting closer to it, <laughs> Unfortunately, I take a keen interest in this stakeholder, mostly because that's where my future lies. And eventually, if you're lucky enough, yours too. This includes nursing homes, home care services, adult care facilities, and rehab centers. Next is volunteer facilities and agencies. Volunteer not-for-profit are, are governed by a volunteer board of directors and provide a significant amount of services and support all throughout this health care organization chart. We also have health profession, education, and training institutions. Well, that's what you're enrolled in right now, and that's what Mercy College is. We also have professional associations. These are national, state, or regional organizations representing healthcare professional and institutions, and they have considerable influence. Next, let's look at the other healthcare industry organizations. This could be insurance, medical supply and equipment, the pharmaceutical industry, which has great power, are in this category. And then lastly, we have research communities. Now, these could be like the National Institute of Health, which you might hear termed as the NIH, or the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. These are two large entities that um, devote all of their energy to research in the field of healthcare. Rural areas of the country are underserved when it comes to healthcare. Their systems are spotty with shortages of services in one area and duplications of services in another. The federal government has answered this issue with rural networks. They may be formally organized as not-for-profits or formally linked for a defined set of mutual, mutually beneficial purposes. 
With costs increasing and populations declining in rural, rural areas, it has been difficult for rural hospitals to continue acute inpatient services. Having rural hospitals is important for many reasons. One, they represent a large employer in their communities. And two, they offer health and services without extensive travel. And three, patient outcomes would suffer without their presence. The Balanced Budget Act of 1997 includes rural hospital flexibility program that replaced the essential access community hospital model that we previously had with the critical access hospital or CAH with the goal of maximizing reimbursements for small rural hospitals basically to help them keep afloat. One of the biggest challenges facing the healthcare system today is an aging population. Being a Gen Xer and with a parent that's a baby boomer, I can see how that is going to impact the system going forward. What's really challenging is as the baby boomers are reaching retirement, which they have started that this process right now, those of us that are employed within the healthcare system will be facing shortages as those boomers retire. But this is also a double-edged sword because as the boomers start to leave the workforce, they're obviously aging and they're going to naturally require more health care. So we really do have a conundrum here with this aging population, this large bubble of individuals who now will be exiting the workforce and then on the flip side, on the same coin, uh, will then be requiring additional health care uh, services. The big question is how will all these services be paid for, this cost of care? Now there is Medicaid and private insurance, but with health care's escalating costs, it's not easy for everyone. Uh, to afford uh, all of those services, especially with this massive quantity of, of the aging population. So this will definitely be a problem coming up in the next decade. In the beginning, we looked at some of the obstacles in the healthcare delivery system, access, cost, and quality being the three big ones. There's no getting around the fact that health care is expensive, no doubt about it. The least expensive option in the long run is prevention. Get lots of rest, exercise, eat well, etc. Easy to say, hard to do. This is all fine and dandy, but as we also discussed, we're all human, and at some point in our lives, we will all need to use the healthcare system. Access for 49 million uninsured or underinsured makes for a large dilemma. Is access to healthcare a human right for all? or is it only for those that can afford it? As we know, there are not-for-profits who will not turn away a patient in need regardless of funds or access to those funds to cover costs. But what about for-profit or private physicians, uh, private physicians or hospitals? Do they have the right to deny access to services if someone cannot pay them? Under the old reimbursement system, the cost of receiving received by the institution for covered care often paid for the indigent in the form of higher costs. This was known as cost shifting and was used extensively until the 80s. A new form of reimbursement was established based on pre-established and fixed rate pricing for a diagnosis. The Affordable Care Act, and from this point forward, I'll just abbreviate it by the ACA, hopes to open access by bringing transparency to providing health care coverage for low-income persons. The other point to be made here is on the quality of health care. There is not a great deal of uh, consistency across the board in this respect. This is not to say that health care is bad everywhere but the quality of it could be better. Better Medical errors lead the way in eroding that quality. They are the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. Remember that if you have a quiz question asking about it, the electronic health record leads the way in keeping 
records accurate, but there is still not a universal standard health record, or at least not yet. Well, thank you for joining me for this week's lecture. Make sure you watch the videos and study the terminology presented in your text, and I know you'll do well on the quiz. And make sure you do read that textbook. I did not touch on every issue, just a few of them. And another thing, make sure uh, that you check the internet out for other viewpoints on the topics presented this week and every week. It's a great resource to get varied opinions on what's presented. Become knowledgeable on the delivery of the healthcare system in the United States. If you need any help, just remember I'm only a call away or you could email me. I'll also be putting my uh, cell phone number in, in the course news, so if you need to, you can text me with your questions. I often prefer to work with you through text messages. I can get back to you a lot quicker. Also, you can post your questions. We still have the virtual office. That will be there. But again, text me if you want a much more rapid response. And remember, if you have a question about something, don't feel that it's a stupid question. There's chances are that there's half of the class will have the same question. So please feel free to bring those forward. All right. Well, that concludes this week's lecture. And as always, thank you for watching.